Now we're going to cover Chinese, Japanese, and Hindu theater, at least the beginnings of them. Remember, in Western theater, after Rome fell, we went into the Dark Ages, and the church banned theater. So for several hundred years, theater was not happening in Europe, but it was happening in other parts of the world. So our question what we want to look at is how did the theater begin in other parts of the world? Our objective is we're going to learn the contributions to theater that came from the Chinese, the Japanese, and the Hindus. By the end of the class, you'll have read the chapter Dawn of Theater, read the part on Chinese, Japanese, and Hindu theater. Chinese theater dates back to about 2000 BC, about 4,000 years ago. We believe it started from interpretive dance. It's, that's a dance that tells a story. As that went along, it became more dramatic in form. What they really like to show is they, they worship their ancestors, so they like to, like to tell stories about their ancestries. And it was also a military celebration. These events were not considered entertainment. Since they revered their ancestors, they were more ceremonies of honor, along with the war stories, too. A matter of fact, theater wasn't open to everybody. Only the emperor, the priests, and the royal court were the ones allowed to participate and watch. Eventually these rituals became more developed. They became more religious and more open for the people. Chinese theater really started to bloom in the 8th and 9th century, largely due to the emperor Ming Hong. What he did, he was so into the theater that he created essentially an acting school in his gardens. And over time, he became the patron saint of Chinese theater. Even today, there's often ceremonies where they will burn incense in honor of him. His theater was very structured. The stories were very structured. It would only cover essentially three themes. They either covered the ancestor worship, which we mentioned before, military glory, they liked the war stories, and faithfulness to husband. As time went on, around 1280, the Mongolians invaded China. When they took over, they took over everything, all aspects of Chinese life. And kind of like when Romans took over the Greeks, the Mongolians took a lot of the Chinese culture and a lot of the Chinese traditions and modified them to fit their needs. Now, the Mongolians were not as educated. They were essentially a collection of small nomadic tribes brought together under Genghis Khan. So what they liked was more entertainment. They didn't like that highfalutin thinking stuff. They wanted to see acrobats and stunts and more dancing and more colorful stuff. Thus, the theater had to change to appease the Mongolians. However, since theater had now moved into more entertainment... Stories had wider choices, and there are stories that have come from the Mongolian conquest that are still looked at today. One famous story is called the Chalk Circle, and you can still see that performed today. It's essentially about a young girl whose family is poor, so the family sells her into a house of prostitution. Common back then. One of the patrons, a rich tax collector, falls in love with her and takes her as a second wife. Once again, that was common back then. She has a baby. And the first wife is jealous of this. So the first wife makes a legal claim that the baby is hers. It doesn't belong to the second wife. So in order to figure out who the baby belongs to, they draw a huge circle out of chalk on the center of the floor. They put the baby in the circle and the two mothers get on each side and try to get the baby to come to her. Whoever the baby comes to is going to be considered the mother. I'm not going to tell you how it ends. You have to look for that on your own. A second story, which was again resurrected later in England, is called the Lute Song. Only back then it was called the Tale of the Pippa. The Pippa is a lute-like instrument, a guitar-like instrument with lots of strings, kind of peach-shaped. You can see a picture of it on the slide. 
This is a story about a lady who loses her husband. Her husband is off on travels and forced to marry another woman. Thus, she loses him. Later, she decides to go search for him. In order to pay for her travels and support herself, she plays the Pippins at very stocks. And that's essentially her travel. She's a wandering performer in search of her husband. Later, these dramas really became influence on regular traditional theater, and the story stayed pretty much unchanged until we hit the World Wars. After the World War II, <coughs> the communist Chinese took over China. What the communist Chinese did just before the 1950s is they took many of these stories and remember these stories, a lot of them talk about military history and honoring your ancestors. And they changed them to fit the communist platform and re-released them that way. Another influence of Chinese theater is what we call the Peking Opera. As theater became more spectacular and colorful and contained a lot of dances, it started getting recognized by the Western world, where we're talking more long in, in, in history. As Westerners saw it, since most of the stuff came out of Peking, out of the city, Westerners started calling it the Peking Opera. It reminded us of our operas, which had larger-than-life costumes and singing and so on. The name just stuck. And that's where Peking Opera came from. It is still seen today. It is still called that. Now, to us, Chinese drama may seem unusual and exotic, largely because of its symbolic quality. Everything in it has specific meanings, but a lot of the stories are still retold today. A uh, very popular version of Wilder's Our Town is actually based on old Chinese stories. There are several characteristics that the Chinese incorporated into their theater. Most of the acting is done by men. The men would even take on women part. Acting is considered a lifelong study. If you were an actor, you were an actor for life. The movements in poses are very highly symbolic. If an actor takes a certain pose or a certain gesture, it always tends to mean the same thing. That means it is very stylized in its movements, and its movements are often graceful, leading us from one symbol to the next, which means every gesture has a very specific meaning. The props also have very specific meaning. Since they started with lot, not a lot of technical stuff outdoors, an example, if a person opens up a red umbrella and white paper falls from it, that essentially symbolizes snow. There's other symbols for rain or bad weather. The actor's costumes are also highly symbolic, especially in their choice of color. Red means faithfulness in the Chinese culture. Blue means cruelty, so the bad guys tend to wear blue. And white is evil, a little different than the Western world where white is good, black is evil. Probably the greatest influence from Chinese theater is Japanese theater. Japanese theater steals a lot of ideas and adapted them for the Japanese culture. Japanese theater also began probably as ritual Shinto. If you're not familiar with Shinto, that is a Japanese religion. Began as their dances. In the 14th century, a form of theater called No, N-O-H, appears, which is very similar to the Chinese drama. It is very formal, and it is intended to be viewed by the aristocrats, by the well-educated. No is upper-class theater. It is still performed today. It is still largely the same thing. It is considered the upper-level theater. No is usually short stories. They tend to be very serious, and they tend to be philosophical in their understanding. They will blend poetry with music and dance. The dance is very different from our Western dance. They have their own stylized version. No staging is also very, very particular. They have exact measurements for their stage. 
Every no stage everywhere is exactly the same size. It's usually created out of 18 foot squares. Audience will sit on three sides of it. It tends to be have a roof supported by four pillars, which we believe copy Shinto um, temples. Remember, theater probably started from the Shinto, so they copied a lot of the temple um, architecture pieces into their stage. The floor is always made out of cypress. And what's interesting is the stage is always on these large jars. The large jars, since they're hollow, they serve as an echo chamber. Echo chamber. So when the actors stomp on it and create certain rhythms, it helps it reverberate throughout the stage. Characters always enter from stage right, and they have a stylized way of entering. The character enters, he introduces himself after he bows to the audience. He talks about where he comes to and where he's going to go in the play. A little prelude there. Usually there'll be a chorus of six to eight men who will be sitting on the side of the stage who help chant the music. Scenery and no is usually just a pine tapestry hung on the back wall. Very few properties, props are used, and the ones that are used are suggestive. If they have a fan, it can be used as a fan. They can fold it up, use it as a dagger. They can hold it open, pretend it's a plate they're eating off of. So they do a lot of pantomime with very minimal props. Their costumes are made of silk. And the cut of the costume, long sleeves, short sleeves, where it falls on the body, tells you the class of the character. Sort of like in our world, if you wear a t-shirt, that represents one thing. If you wear a business suit, you have casual business suits, you have very formal ones. So the cut determines the social class of the actors. They would also wear masks with stylized faces, and there's 15 expressions they would recognize. So by wearing the mask, they got a very specific point across. Another form of theater that came out of Japan is called kaijin. Since no is very, very serious, they needed to break it up with a little bit of comedy. So essentially, kaijin is the comedy breaks. They will use comedic masks. They will not use the music. And it usually will be performed well. no is going on. There'll be a series. You'll do a no play. you do a kaijin, a no, a kaijin, a no, and a kaijin. Kind of to keep your mind switching from serious to comedy. Another form of theater that came out of Japan is bunraku. This is called doll theater. It came about in the 17th century. They use about a four-foot doll. The actors will wear black, and they will manipulate the dolls into doing the movement while the play is going on. So the idea is since they're in black, they're invisible, the dolls are the characters. Probably one of the more form famous is kabuki theater. Quite often, kabuki is just generally used to describe Japanese theater, but it is also very specific. It is theater for the common man, so its themes are not as large as a no, or not as serious. It will use song and dance. It will also be a little more um, sensationalized, and it can be more drama. They can go all the way into the telenovela themes. Kabuki began in about the 1600s, and it can contain a wide range. Usually it will have heavy, serious, once again, think of soap operas. Kabuki is almost like Japanese soap operas, quite often involving passionate love triangles. A Kabuki playhouse is different than the No playhouse, so you wouldn't even go to the same venue to watch them. It will use a large stage, but it will tend not to have roof. Because, once again, it is for the common people, so it could be performed outdoors. Actors enter through a specific, what they call the flower way, which means they enter through the audience. Their doors will, their stages will often contain trap doors. So the audience or the actors can do these really spectacular popping up on the stage, disappearing. And some of their plays would contain demons and magical creatures. And this would be a way they would magically appear and un unappear. Like most other, Kabuki uses very specific costumes. They tend to be a little over the top on their color and their scenery. 
Just before the 1800s, they started to use revolving stages, which also work with the trap doors to make the entrance and exits much cooler. And it also allowed scenery to change. Remember, no only had one piece of scenery draped in the background. This became more like our traditional theater with changes of scenery. Costumes were also silk and elaborate. They did not wear a mask, but what they would do is they would paint their face often to look like the mask. And this is what people think a lot about with Kabuki. We think of the very white faces, the high eyebrows, and stylized lips. They would also tend to wear wigs to differentiate between their characters. A certain wig indicated a certain type of character. No and Kabuki have several characteristics they share together. And both acting and skill is considered very, very important. Once again, it was a lifelong endeavor. Actors, the men played all the parts. Usually the men would play women. This is no longer true. However, since Japan is still steeped in traditions, you find very few women actually doing kabuki. Even now that it's legal for women to do it. And often the actors are along family lines. If you were an actor, it usually means your parents were an actor, your grandparents were probably an actor. The Japanese also followed the Chinese tradition of having very symbolic movements, presentations, rhythmic, moving from one pose to another. Another form of theater was Hindu theater, mostly in India. This goes all the way back to about 1500 BC, so about three, 4,000 years ago it started. We believe it began as dialogue in the religious hymns, kind of like in the Greeks. Dialogue became plays. According to the Greek mythology, Brahma is the one who invented theater. Brahma is a very famous god. So here they say the god said theater now exists. And he commanded that the first playhouse be built. However, what we consider theater really did not begin until about the 5th century BC. And it was usually composed of stories that came out of Sanskrit, which was the written language of the upper class. Um, It was usually performed in gardens or in the courthouses of palaces which were built. They would actually put uh, the rich people, the nobility, would put a stage out in the gardens in one end of the building. The scenery was usually a decorated wall. And in this wall, there was a room leading to what they called the green room. Nobody's really sure why it's called the green room. It's just a Hindu tradition. This is where the actors went and relaxed. If you go to any professional theater or even a studio, there tends to be a lounge, and the lounge is always referred to as the green room, even in modern-day theater. The people who went to see Hindu theater, their patrons, patrons, somebody who supports them, had a great love of beauty. So their theater was very considered delicate and very intimate and very restrained, meaning subtle stories. It was performed strictly for entertainment, entertainment of the pleasant court, of the pleasant type. They didn't want to overthink it. They didn't want you to leave sad. So the endings were always happy. Hindu is probably the first theater to let women act on stage. So thank India for that. So if you have any questions, please get a hold of me either on the website or at my email, jcook at sisd.net. I hope you enjoyed the lecture.